So the purpose of the rest of Brother Layton's book and the rest of this quarter's Sunday morning lessons is to examine case studies that will show how people in Scripture made the journey from hopelessness through the waypoints of hope sparked, hope sensed, and hope seen in their relationship with Jesus Christ to hopefulness. So starting today, you can see that first lesson, January the 15th, and uh, that's probably where we are. My date isn't there. There we are. Yep, we're here. January the 15th, so I'm on track. Um, why don't we start at the rock bottom of Jewish social structure of the day? Uh, I hope you have a Bible with you, or you have a Bible app, or something like that. If you do, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, and that's how we'll start this morning. Um, I may mention this again sometime, but the best thing you're going to hear today is God's Word. Nothing anybody else can say, nothing you you can read is as good as what you're about to hear. And it's not because of my voice, it's because of the author. I'm reading out of the old New International Version. Yeah, there's a newer New International Version, but this is the Bible that uh, my parents gave me when I enlisted in the Air Force. And I've been carrying around for 30 plus years got a lot of notes in it. Uh, I understand that the dynamic equivalence translation may not be the most effective literal word for word, but it gets the point across. You look in the version that you've got in front of you, and if you find words that are a little bit different and they're better, then go with those. It's God's word. He's going to bless it when we open ourselves to it. Matthew 8, verses 1 through 4. When he, talking about Jesus, came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man, the leper. I am willing, Jesus said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone But go, show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So let's get a little medical about the the leper stuff just for a minute. In today's world, there are lots of diseases that strike fear in a person. Reasonably so. Cancer is one. And Dave's talked about his recent diagnosis and and blessed recovery. Uh, AIDS is another. Just, you know, somebody's got that. Oh, man, that is striking fear into you. Alzheimer's is another. Aging, aging folks worry about and stress about that diagnosis and reasonably strikes fear in our hearts. In Bible times, the disease of leprosy might have been the most dreaded disease. Leprosy, though, was a term used to describe a whole bunch of different skin diseases and a whole bunch of different symptoms, most of which wouldn't lead to a modern diagnosis of leprosy. But everybody thought it was contagious, so anyone unfortunate enough to have any of the symptoms would be labeled unclean, unclean, and then they'd be cast out of the city or village or whatever community, and then they'd be forced to live away from everyone except other lepers. And people with symptoms like this remained that way, isolated and apart from clean society until the priests declared them clean. And you can find examples of the rules of that in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14, as well as other places. Jesus healed many people of many diseases, including leprosy, during his time on earth. And his healing work drew lots of large crowds. Some of the people in the crowds were probably just curious. Oh, what's this? There's a bunch of people. Let's go see what's going on. Um, Some might have had hidden agendas. Oh, this fellow says he's the Messiah? Well, listen, I represent the Pharisees, and I'm here to tell you that ain't no Messiah. Now, I'm paraphrasing. That would be West Texas vernacular. But there were folks with hidden agendas. They wanted to catch him in a lie, catch him in a heresy. But some of the people in the crowds, at least, were poor. They were hungry. They were sick. And these folks, the poor and hungry and sick, Maybe because of their desperation. You might call it hopelessness. You could. It'd be all right in this class about hope to call it hopelessness. That led Jesus to welcome them, to welcome these crowds, even to touch them. 
And in some cases, the Bible says Jesus saw that they needed healing from a physical illness, but they also needed a human touch, like in the example we see here in Matthew 8. The problem may have been, uh, as Jesus saw them, he looked into their heart, and he saw that they needed spiritual healing, something that he also offered. The problem may have been physical, maybe social and emotional, or maybe the things on the outside were just a distraction from the real problem of spiritual death. But no matter the problem, the desperate people in those crowds needed hope. Now, scripture doesn't tell us of every time Jesus healed people, but the many examples that are in the scriptures include housefuls and hordes of people came to him for healing. So could a leper have snuck into one of those venues? Maybe somebody who hadn't been a leper for very long, or maybe someone whose symptoms were hidden. And maybe that, that leper didn't declare their uncleanness. Or maybe Jesus could have detoured to a leper camp during his travels. But that wasn't recorded for us in Scripture. John twenty one twenty five says, If everything Jesus did was written down, the whole world wouldn't have space enough for all the books. I think it's likely that Jesus had more interactions with lepers than we find in the Bible, but that's just my opinion. There are, however, we can all agree, at least two interactions with lepers that come to mind right away. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus healed ten lepers. And what's memorable to me about this event is that as the ten were obeying Jesus' command to go show themselves to the priests... And as they were healed along the way, only one traveled back to Jesus to say thank you. And we don't know how far the ten had traveled before they were healed. It might have been just as they turned away and poof, like that. Or it might have been as they left the outskirts of the village. Or they might have been a mile down the road. Scripture doesn't tell us. We just know that one of them came back to say thank you. The other nine lepers who healed at this point, they were healed, right? They kept on going just as Jesus had commanded them. And, and we shouldn't condemn them for their decision to keep on obeying the Lord. But Jesus is especially pleased with the one who turned back to give thanks. And takes advantage of the fact that he was a Samaritan to point out to the Jews that were around him, look at this here Samaritan who came back to tell me thank you. This happened right on the border between uh, uh, Samaria uh, and um, Galilee. So they were about to go around. Jesus was about to go around Samaria to get Jerusalem. So there were Samaritans nearby, and the Jews really didn't like them. <clears throat> anyway, um, Jesus is praising this man who's twice rejected by society. First, he's rejected for being a Samaritan, and again for being a leper. Jesus offers grace to lepers and Samaritans, and that's a good basis for our hope. Now, the other quick-to-remember healing of a leper is the subject of our lesson this morning and of this Bible reading that we had. It appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we've already read, and I've, or I've read, and hopefully you read along with me, the version in Matthew. Um, <clears throat> it's always good to know the context here, and Matthew records this miracle right after the Sermon on the Mount. So maybe the leper was present at the event and heard some of Jesus' teachings there. Maybe on the outer fringe most likely on the outer fringe, because uh, he was a leper. But maybe he kind of snuck in among the crowd, kind of concealed the smell, concealed the symptoms, um, and surreptitiously kind of drew close. We can imagine him quietly following along with the crowd as Jesus makes his way down from the mountainside. Maybe he cleverly puts himself in the most likely path Jesus would take down the mountain. So he could ask Jesus for healing, like trying to, oh, he's going to walk this way. Let me, if I get over here just right, this is where he's, I know he's going to have to come through this pass right here, and I'll be right there. I'll be right there, right by the Lord. We can also imagine that the words he heard during the amazing Sermon on the Mount would have stirred his heart. And perhaps he thrilled to hear the promise of blessings for those who were poor in spirit and meek. That's Matthew 5, 3 through 5. Perhaps it was to not be anxious, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Maybe he remembered the promise of ask and it will be given from Matthew 7, 7. Whatever it was he heard, he demonstrated faith as he seized his opportunity to approach the teacher. Now, as this event unfolds, several things happen in the short passage. <clears throat> the leper approaches Jesus in humility. He got down on his knees. 
And from this humble posture, he professed his faith in Jesus to heal. If you are willing, the leper says, you can make me clean. Now that's what it says in the NIV. Your version might vary a little bit. Jesus preached and practiced humility and sincerity. And this leper, this, this leper, exemplified those very traits. Moved by the leper's faith, humility, and need. The Mark's version, Mark 141, tells us that Jesus had pity for him. And he reached out and touched him and healed him immediately. He then tells the man to keep quiet about it. Don't tell anybody what happened, but to do what the law of Moses required, which was to go and show himself to the priests and be declared clean. Why the command to keep quiet? We don't know. We can speculate about it, though, a little bit. Maybe Jesus knew that word of this miracle would draw even larger crowds of the sick, which would distract his primary mission of spiritual healing. Mark's account indeed says the leper told everybody about it and afterwards Jesus was unable to openly teach because of the huge crowds that would gather for physical healing or maybe to see the physical miracles take place, you know, a matter of, of curiosity perhaps. Jesus probably knew that the man was going to tell everyone even though he told him not to. I mean, it's human nature, isn't it? to rejoice when something wonderful or awesome happens. But even knowing that this man was going to do that, and knowing what would happen as a result, that his ministry would be complicated, Jesus healed him anyway. That's another example of the grace and compassion that our Lord has for those who approach him humbly, and those who approach him professing their faith in him. He acts. People like us. Right? He acts for us. So uh, what happens after this to the leper? Well, what about the other night? We, we don't really know what happened later. The former leper, this one who came back, did he go and show himself to the priests? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. I think he probably did. Did he stop telling everybody about it? I mean, not at first, we know, because Mark, Mark tells us that he did, and it caused problems. Maybe, though... Once things settled down, <clears throat> and this man, this one who turned back, was alone with his thoughts. Could have been months, weeks, could have been years later. Did he have time to reflect on the miracle of healing that he received? Probably so. I can't imagine that not being a part of his life. Maybe he again knelt down in humility to thank God. Maybe for us, it's in these quiet moments of reflection and memory of our desperate need and our own remarkable recovery that we say thank you. Maybe for the first time, if the relief sparked other actions first, a reaction of joy, for example. So perhaps, though, as we remember our life and we see forgiveness of our disease of sin, it would bring us to our knees in humility to give thanks to Jesus for our healing. That is an absolutely appropriate and should be an ongoing expression of repentance that feeds our resolve to live faithfully for the Master we love so much. It's not, it's not living in my sin of the past, but it's recognizing where I came from. Recognizing how bad things were for me and how I have matured and grown in my journey. From when I first came to the Lord and had my hope sparked, when I joined in the Christian community and had hope sensed, and then as I mature into hope seen, approaching my reward. It, this is also something that shouldn't just be internal. Not just something that we do inside ourselves, maybe quietly between us and the Lord. It's important. It's vital. That communication is the most important. But we live in a community. So we should share our experiences with others, young and old, not physical age, certainly physical age, but I'm talking about where we are in these waypoints. Share our journey with others. And that helps us reinforce with each other that we are in a community of former lepers, cleansed by a gracious Lord. And this is a foundational truth, that Jesus makes the unclean clean. 
all the various conditions from what we'd call bad acne to psoriasis to allergic rashes to hives to boils to Hansen's disease, which is the cool technical term for leprosy today. Any symptoms of any of those conditions made the person unclean and earned him the label of leper. Isolated from society, from family, from faith fellowship, unable to participate in any gathering, whether it's secular or spiritual. Just like the various conditions called leprosy in the Bible, sin is a disease that makes us unclean before God. Sin is incurable by ourselves or by others. No other man, only Jesus, God made flesh, can cleanse us from it. As the New Testament says over and over and over again from Acts to Revelation, from the beginning, our sin caused us to be removed from God's presence in a similar way that leprosy forced this man to be removed from the presence of others. When we humbly come to Jesus, professing our faith that he can cleanse us, he accepts us, he touches us, and he heals us. That really puts us as the focus, doesn't it? What Jesus does for us. That's right. If I had been the only person who'd sinned, Christ would have come for me. And so it's personal. It's personal for me. Just like it's personal for you. But we also have a mission. And that mission is to express the compassion of Jesus. In Matthew 25, Jesus gives us a glimpse of Judgment Day there, and he says, Those found faithful will enjoy their inheritance through an eternal life with God. Those who are unfaithful will be rejected to eternal punishment. Now, I want the former, and no thank you very much to the latter. I imagine y'all are probably in the same boat. How do I move then to the third waypoint, the confidence of hope seen? This is practical, folks. Jesus says the faithful, Matthew 25, were caring for those in need, including those who are sick. Jesus doesn't say the faithful were healing the sick. He says the faithful were visiting the sick. Jesus recognized in the life of a leper the intense loneliness caused by that disease and its accompanying isolation. Knowing this, Jesus lived the words he would speak. He doesn't just tell us, he shows us. Each of the actions described in Matthew 25 are ordinary things that ordinary people can do. Like Jesus, we can feed the hungry. Like Jesus, we can welcome the visitor. Like Jesus, we can can clothe the cold and exposed. Like Jesus, we can visit the prisoners and the sick. Jesus says when we do these things, it's just like we are doing them to him. And also, Jesus did these things with an attitude of love and compassion. We become more like Jesus as we grow in these areas. And and as we grow, we'll find healing for ourselves and for those we care about. In this world, then and now, those who are hurting and in great need can be isolated. They can be scorned, be rejected by family and friends. Jesus reaches out to those who are burdened and weary and says, Come to me and I'll give you rest. That's Matthew 8, 28. We who come to Jesus will find love and acceptance and compassion. Most of all, we'll find in Jesus healing from the most serious disease, and that's the disease of sin. So as we draw to a close this morning, let's examine the leper's journey out of hopelessness through the waypoints to hopefulness. So when hope sparked, we can imagine that the leper felt a spark of hope as he listened to the Sermon on the Mount. Perhaps he even heard of Jesus earlier as word spread And his popularity, that is, Jesus' popularity began to be known. We can imagine this leper's thoughts that maybe, just maybe, he could be healed just as others had been healed. And then he moved to hope sensed. As the leper humbly knelt before Jesus, professing his faith, he begins to sense hope as Jesus reaches out and touches him. Matthew 8, 3, this touch. It's very likely that this is the first compassionate human touch that the leper had experienced in a long time, certainly since his symptoms came up. What an amazing sensation that would be, the sensing of touch. And then he moves to hope seen. Not only did this man, the leper, 
feel the compassionate touch. He sensed the compassionate touch. But he also heard this most simple and most hoped for statement. I am willing, be clean. And he immediately received this healing. It's no wonder that he rejoices. He's confident of his healing from leprosy and he tells everybody about his journey to hopefulness. So in this event, we see a man's rescue from hopelessness due to physical disease, also emotional distress, also social estrangement. And in a brief interaction, everything was restored as this leper humbly approached Jesus for healing. And as Jesus touched him, he was transformed from unclean to clean. Jesus didn't have to speak to the leper to heal him. He didn't have to touch him to heal him. But he knew that the words and the touch were needed by the leper to meet his needs. Now, in a similar way, when we're touched by the blood of Jesus through baptism, we are spiritually cleansed and made alive. This cleansing also puts us in a relationship with God that includes citizenship in his kingdom, right here with us, membership in his family. And then we're commanded to live faithfully as God's servants. And why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we be overwhelmed with joy and gratitude seeing as how we've been rescued from our own hopelessness? And it's worth noting that faith, faithful living includes telling others about Jesus. Some may doubt that they know enough But just like the leper, we can begin by telling others what Jesus has done for us. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. I look forward to speaking with you again later today, but in class next week.